Hello and welcome to Med Mother Matriarch with me, Louise Perry. My guest today is Brad Wilcox. He's the director of the National Marriage Project and also a fellow of the Institute for Family Studies and the author of a new book called Get Married, <laughs> which is about the uh, sociological advantages inherent to the institution of monogamous marriage. We spoke about uh, why about a third of Gen Z uh, Americans are expected not to get married, not to get married at any point where that's a bad thing. Um, the uh, emergence of female breadwinners, what uh, Brad refers to as the neo-traditional marriage model and the effect that male employment patterns have on marital happiness. In the extended version of the episode, we also spoke about uh, child-free weddings, the um, uh, effects of same-sex marriages on um, the marital institution as a whole and why women are more likely to initiate divorces than our men. That extended version of the episode is available at louiseperry.substack.com where you can also find the back catalogue of extended episodes, the bonus episodes I do fortnightly with my husband and of course the MMM chat community. Enjoy. Many of you will know that Christianity is a subject of fascination for me and the role of Christianity in shaping the modern world is a theme I return to again and again on the podcast. My view is that we can't really understand ourselves or understand the world around us without getting to grips with it, which is why I'm very glad to put you towards a new online course called 321. It's an introduction to Christianity that's imaginative, thoughtful, engaging. It assumes absolutely no prior knowledge. It's presented by the wonderful Glenn Scrivener, who has been a guest on the MMM podcast previously, and I've also been a guest on his show. Glenn presents eight video-led sessions, which are based around some beautiful animated stories that illustrate the Christian message. You can check it out for free at 321course.com forward slash MMM. Just enter your email, choose a password, and you're in. There's no spam, there's no fees. Just visit 321course.com forward slash MMM. Uh, Brad, can we start by talking about the the sort of demographic picture of the death of marriage? Because I think everyone listening will be aware that the um, marriage is an institution. Thinking obviously about America in particular, because that's the subject of your book, but this applies in the UK just as much, if anything, maybe more so. That America uh, that, that marriage as an institution has really been declining, um, certainly since the nineteen sixties. But it is not a consistent picture, right? Like there's a lot of ways in which um, marriage has clung on much more in some demographics and declined much more sharply in others. Tell me about that, that demographic story. Yeah, so what we see in the research is that about <clears throat> the marriage rates come down by about 65% since 1970. And what that means you kind of going forward is we're projecting that you know probably more than one in three of Gen Z or so 20 something today will never marry. So this is kind of like record demographic territory. I think what some folks who have been kind of really following this issue, though, realize is that sort of the retreat from marriage has been most consequential for working class and poor Americans. So the vast majority of kids, for instance, that are being raised today by <clears throat> college educated Americans, by Americans in the upper you know 40 percent are being raised in married parent families. By contrast, we're seeing you know a large share of kids in working class and poor families being raised in you know in single uh, and single parent families or in cohabiting families uh, today. So there's a, a class divide that's kind of emerged around uh, this retreat for marriage. And it just tells us that sort of what's happened to marriage has had a disparate impact on working class and poor Americans. And of course, the same basic story is true in the United Kingdom as well. Um, we see as we look kind of across the continent that there's a lot of similar trends playing out both in the United Kingdom and in, in the United States as well. So what some people will, will think, what I thought a bit when I hear figures like one in three Gen Z will not ever get married, is that, yeah, but maybe they are kind of living as married. It's a quite, sorry, quaint phrase that you'll sometimes hear, living as married. They haven't actually had the ceremony, but they still have basically the stable long-term monogamous relationship. There are clearly examples of that, but would you say that that, how widespread would you say that that kind of model is? So, so it's certainly true both in the United States and the UK and obviously in Europe that cohabitation is more, you know, common today than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, obviously. Um, and that continues to kind of tick upwards. But sort of the growth of cohabitation does not basically 
um, <clears throat> kind of make up for the, you know, the decline of marriage. So we're still seeing more and more, you know, young adults who are living either on their own with, you know, housemates, friends, or in their parents' basement, right? And so even if you combine cohabiting and married couples, you know, for young adults, we're still seeing that there's a, just a greater share of Americans who are unpartnered. And I talk about this in terms of like, the, we're seeing the closing of the American heart and fold. We're dating, marrying, and having children are in... <clears throat> pretty, pretty dramatic retreat um, in the U.S. and across much of, of the developed world. Hey, so who are the people who are, you see, we, we, we've mentioned the class factor. What are the other factors that uh, predict how likely one is to get married? So I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with religion, but how does it break down in terms of both religiosity and also denomination and so on? In the United States, we kind of talked a lot about the way in which there's this big class divide in marriage. That's kind of common knowledge among folks who study the issue. I think what my book brings to the table, it's a bit new, is it kind of extends uh, our thinking and our, our perspective to the cultural story. And so we see that there are both on the class side, college educated Americans are more likely to get and stay married. But on the cultural side, we're seeing that Asian Americans, religious Americans, and then conservative Americans are also much more likely to be married today um, than their <clears throat> liberal and moderate peers, their secular peers, um, their black and Hispanic peers, and their less educated peers. So there are these kind of cross-cutting divides that sort of mark American family life, and they run along a number of different axes, um, including the ones I've just just touched on, Luis. Um. Interesting. So, so being conservative, well, I mean, I suppose it shouldn't be a surprise that being conservative would be a predictor of whether or not one is likely to get married. But I'd always, I'd, I've often heard it said that that's more to do with with things like religiosity. But you're saying no, even a even a non religious conservative, to, you know, such people do exist. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, when I kind of began this project, to be frank, I really thought it would be, I thought I'd have three groups to look at, you know, in terms of like what I call the masters of marriage, folks who are doing relatively well when it comes to getting married, staying married and being happily married in the United States. So I thought I would have Asian Americans, I thought I'd have religious Americans and, <clears throat> and what I call the strivers or college educated Americans, folks who kind of have this long term orientation, doing well financially, have more social skills oftentimes, and just kind of, you know, have the, uh, <clears throat> some advantages when it comes to, you know, getting married, staying married. But as I was kind of running the numbers, Louise, what I found was that even controlling for things like religion and, and education, I still found the conservatives were doing relatively better off when it came to getting married in the first place and being happily married in the second place. So that's kind of one of, for me, that's one of the surprising things about this story is that, <clears throat> um, you know, even controlling for the fact that conservatives tend to be better are not always obviously more religious. Um, you still find a conservative premium when it comes to marriage today. I think that's in part because there's an appreciation for marriage as an institution. And there's an appreciation, too, for, you know, many of the norms and customs that have classically attached to marriage and family life that actually end up still having a great deal of utility. Now, you and I both appreciate Edmund Burke. And he, of course, recognized that traditions often, but not always, kind of convey some kind of socially useful practice to us. And today, a lot of progressives discount, obviously, the value of tradition on many fronts. And of course, there are some traditions that need to go by the wayside. You know, we can imagine what those are. But when it comes to marriage and family life, a lot of the traditions that have come up through the ages are ones that are helpful to us and, and conservatives are more likely to appreciate. So one example is I find, for instance, that couples who have the same last name are more likely to be happily married. I think about this kind of as a sort of a team mentality, kind of we're, we're one, we, we share the same last name, we're the, the Wilcox family or the Johnson family or the <clears throat> Hernandez family. And having this common last name, you know, gives, I think, folks a sense of a we before, it's one way of kind of operationalizing what I call we before me mindset, you know, in the book. And couples who embrace this sort of we before me approach, this, this teamwork, you know, kind of mentality, are more likely to be flourishing. Another example is I talk about just the, the advantage that follows from having joint checking accounts, which is more of a traditional practice, right? You know, you kind of pool your money, share money, you're a couple, you know, what's yours is mine and mine is yours as, you know, husband and wife. Um, and there's a lot of contemporary journalists and financial professionals who are, you know, basically encouraging folks. I, I mentioned a journalist in the Atlantic, kind of encouraging young couples to keep their money separate. And yet we know that couples 
don't follow that advice, you know, are more likely to be flourishing uh, financially and otherwise. And there's even experimental evidence that showed that when they randomly assign newly married couples to joint accounts and separate accounts, this is an Indiana University study, the couples who were randomly assigned to joint accounts did markedly better in the first two years of marriage. So I think, again, one reason conservatives are more likely to be flourishing is they tend to be more open to a lot of these customs that have kind of sprung up over the years, centuries, in some cases, that um, have some social value for um, marriage and family, even in 2024. It's very interesting you, you, you talk about the random allocation to joint accounts, because what I was going to ask, what I'm sure you're, you're expecting to be asked, is how do we know that it's the practices themselves versus the people involved? You know, maybe the people who, maybe women who don't take their husband's last name are less invested in the relationship, or maybe, you know, the, the feminist way, the, the way some feminists might describe this, to put it to try and play devil's advocate is maybe these women have particularly high standards for their partners. Maybe they're particularly unlikely to put up with terrible behavior, even put up with abuse. Maybe that's why you see these patterns between basically more, more modern feminist liberal practices and, and, and less, uh, less durable marriages. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think that's a legitimate kind of pushback against some of the findings that I convey in, you know, in the book. So on the, on the, the shared last name thing, I can't make a causal argument, you know, that's too robust, you know, because I don't have, I, we can't randomly assign couples to shared last names and keeping their own, uh, their own names, you know, after the marriage. Um, but as I said, what's great about this new study from Indiana is it's randomly ass assigning couples to you know, joint or separate accounts. And it kind of gives us a sense of like, do you want to do kind of the modern thing, the more individualistic thing when it comes to organizing your money? Or do you want to do the thing that, you know, is more customary? And it, I think tends to promote a more we before me approach to your money. And it's the couples who are randomly assigned to that latter, you know, strategy who are more likely to be flourishing. Um, so, but yeah, we can't, <clears throat> we, I can't, for everything that I'm fine, I can't say it's, it, it's causal. But I, what I can though, I think tell you, Luis, is that the kinds of people who um, would embrace, you know, shared accounts, the kinds of, well, and the kinds of people who would embrace um, shared last names, for instance, are also the kinds of people who are more likely to be flourishing in their marriages, you know, today in the 21st century. And that's, I think, that at least I think can be somewhat surprising to a lot of progressives who tend to think that kind of embracing the newest thing, the newest norm, the newest fad is going to be the path to um, <clears throat> flourishing in your marriage. And there are many cases in my book where I can show that's actually <clears throat> completely wrong. So I want to ask a little bit more about this. The, 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 I think you referred to the Striver group, right? Who, let's say the sort of New York Times readers, okay, or the Guardian readers in the UK context. The, because my understanding um, when I was writing my own book, but this was a while ago now, and I'm not as abreast of the literature as you are, was that even though, yes, you will read a lot of articles in the New York Times and the Guardian, et cetera, about um, polyamory <laughs> and um, women foregoing marriage for feminist reasons and women leaving their husbands for feminist reasons. And, you know, you will, you will read a lot of sort of um, progressive uh, apologia for broken homes of various kinds, okay, but in a, obviously in an elite way. Um, Despite this, it is still the case that these that this social group does tend to still get married and stay married. Is that true? Is it still the case that they're they're behaving like nineteen fifties but talking like the nineteen sixties? Yeah, it is. And you know, I've got a couple of examples in the book. You know, I talk about, for instance, Reed Hastings, who's the co-founder of Netflix. Um, and there's obviously a lot of content on Netflix that you know is isn't particularly marriage friendly. The, the example that I give is just the marriage story. It's this, you know, movie about this couple in New York and LA and, you know, they're educated, they're affluent. Um, but their, I mean, their marriage kind of dissolves in, you know, uh, for reasons that are really all not, I don't think all that important and valid. Um, but it kind of just gives us a pretty dystopian portrait of marriage. And what's, you know, I think kind of striking about this particular case is that in general, we know that college educated Americans today are forming stable marriages. So this marriage story is actually telling a false story. And the other, I think, irony here is that Reed Hastings himself, like many, you know, educated and affluent Californians, and we have a report on this on California back in, 
in 2019, we find that educated Californians like Reed Hastings, <clears throat> affluent, you know, Californians like Reed Hastings are much more likely to be stably married, as is Reed Hastings. I mean, married more than 30 years, talks about in his autobiography how he and his wife had some trouble early on in their marriage, went to a marital counselor, they've got two kids, but they kind of managed to make it. Um, and, you know, so there's just this kind of disjunction between a lot of our elites are even presiding over products um, that discount the importance um, of marriage or paint a false portrait of marriage, even as they themselves benefit um, for marriage. There's obviously a real financial benefit. There's a social benefit. There's an emotional benefit that follows from getting and staying married. And so I think our elites tend to realize at some tacit level that it's the smart move. The strivers realize like, look, you're going to get your college degree. You're going to get your graduate degree, you're going to get a good job. Then you're going to get married and then you're going to have children. Um, but they are reluctant to publicly articulate the value of marriage because it's seen as being not very progressive. And I've got a piece in the Atlanta coming out um, in uh, mid-February, basically talking about how our elites talk left, walk right, that gives you know kind of more evidence on this score. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would say that's true on a lot of things. I mean, Rob Henderson's idea of luxury beliefs is useful here, right? Um, and I'm sure that there's there's clearly some truth to that in practice on the marriage score and on so many other things. Um, it seems as well as if, I, I, it seems as if elite people are instinctively better at making um, uh, wise social decisions in relation to things like marriage when there is no template in place which would lead them towards making those wise social decisions but that doesn't seem to be the case across the board. But but there also isn't a sort of so recognition think, of that fact. Yeah, so I think Rob Henderson's idea of luxury beliefs about how our elites will often kind of, you know, nominally adhere to beliefs like to fund the police um, that end up hurting people besides themselves. Um, and then, but often will tend to jettison them as well um, when they're no longer kind of socially valuable. Um, so I think we see a lot of that when it comes to sort of public discourse about family and marriage, um, even about gender. You know, one of the things that I point out in the book is that even though our elites tend to kind of discount the importance of male breadwinning, you know, it doesn't take, if you just kind of think about it for a second, which group of Americans, which group of, you know, Brits are the most likely to have a reliable breadwinner in their own homes. <laughs> it's, it's our elites. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I've got this great chart in the book that shows basically, um, that for, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about female breadwinners, you know, in, in, in the United States and in the press and, you know, and, and uh, among policymakers and academics. And, you know, <clears throat> when you look at the bottom income, sorry, the bottom income quintile for families, what you find is that a majority of our lowest income families are sort of headed by or, or, or housing female breadwinners who, who bring in the majority of the income. But when you look at <clears throat> the top income quintile, you see only 15% of our wealthiest families are families where um, the wife is you know, earning basically more than 60% of the household income. Um, so it just kind of gives you a sense of you know, the way in which, again, our elites on things like gender often talk left and then walk right in their own, in the privacy of their own, you know, in, in their own homes, basically. Mm. Yeah. Basically the gender, the gender pay gap is an artifact of the top 10% sort of thing, because there are these very, very high earning men who really drag it up. Right. So yeah. So we still see, obviously, and everyone knows this, that in, in sort of the upper precincts of our economy, it's still the case that men tend to dominate. Um, and that also translates into, obviously, in families, in wealthier families, it's still the case that oftentimes it's, it's the husband who is, you know, earning, you know, a larger share of the income. Um, but again, the, the, the irony here is that people will pro publicly profess some very progressive idea about gender, and then privately, you know, um, expect and, and rely upon, you know, themselves or their husband to, um, you know, to be that reliable male breadwinner for the family. Yeah. Yes, I mean, yeah, increasingly that 1950s family model is basically only to be found in the most 
uh, rarefied of circles, while it's also, of course, um, condemned <laughs> in precisely those circles. It's a very yeah, that's the irony, is that there's a sort of, I mean, not, people obviously, I mean, men are much more engaged, obviously, in the practical work of raising children, you know, doing housework, child, I mean, child care, cooking, cleaning, all that kind of stuff, um, up and down the spectrum. But, you know, and that's obviously changed a lot. And women are working in, in larger numbers. And I do find when it comes, for instance, to the, you know, one of the new things that we see, so I talk about kind of like a neo-traditional marriage being the one that I think tends to end up making married mothers the happiest. So it's, what you have basically is a situation where the husband is employed full time, um, is practically and emotionally engaged in, in, in the marriage and the life of the family. I don't find that sort of the division of who does what around the house is a big predictor of marital satisfaction for women. But I do find that the husband's engagement with the kids, practical engagement, you know, time devoted to the children um, is, is a big predictor for women across the ideological spectrum. And it's kind of a mark of his commitment to the family, if you will. Um, so I kind of, I, I sort of describe this as a kind of a neo-traditional or family first model. And so men who are kind of doing this and doing it well, obviously, um, end up having wives who who are happily married. Um, now, obviously, in terms of it, all this does depend for women in terms of their ideology. So much more progressive minded women are going to be much more keen about a kind of a more 50 50 approach. But there are plenty of women in the middle and women who are conservative who, you know, are happy with a relatively traditional division of of, you know, household labor, you know, regarding housework. How does um, female employment fit into the neo-traditional model? So, yeah, and this is an important question. So mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think what's, in a sense, neo about this, and I didn't necessarily expect to find this, um, but I didn't find that kind of the precise division of earnings was a big predictor of marital quality for contemporary couples, for both men and women. And I didn't find that the wife's work, in one way or, or another, was a big predictor of marital quality. So what I'm saying to you is sort of the traditional piece here in, in the research that I'm coming up with is that having a husband who is stably employed full time is a predictor of higher marital quality um getting married women are still more likely to look for someone who's decently employed than men are that's a bigger concern for women than men even today there's a pew study on this recently um but the precise division of kind of who earns what not as big a deal today and whether or not she works not as big a deal today so the, so again i think there's still a sense in which his capacity to flourish as a breadwinner matters, but kind of exactly how she organizes her, you know, working family is much more kind of left to the couple in terms of how that's associated with flourishing in today's marriages. So does that suggest that the stay at home dad model is not one that is likely to lead to, well, I'm, I'm being too leading. So, again, what is the know, data tell us about that? Right, I mean, that's, that's all right. So I, it's important to you, if you look at the book, I mean, you'll see these differences, you know, it might be five percentage points, 10 percentage points, you know, from one finding to the next. So what we do find basically is that married mothers are happier when their husbands are working full time. They're less happy when their husbands are stay at home dads. And it's not a huge difference, but it is a difference. And I mean, I also know, you know, happily married couples where, you know, the dad is a stay at home dad, but it's just kind of, again, worth underlining that the kind of connection between men, marriage, and fatherhood and full-time work, I think, remains, you know, pretty strong in the 21st century, which is in some ways what this is telling us. One more interesting piece on this too is that the Harvard professor, Sasha Kilowald, um, sociology at Harvard, did a study looking at the effects of unemployment for couples. Um, when the wife loses her job, no increase in divorce. When the husband loses a job, divorce increases by 33%, okay? So just one more indicator that, again, there's something about men and work and marriage that's profoundly important. And of course, the challenge facing us here in part is that we're seeing a, but about 20% of prime age men not being employed full time and an even greater share of men who don't have a college degree, who aren't in that striver category, Luis, who are not employed full time, about <clears throat> one in four for that group. So because more and more men are not employed full time, you know, that's one more factor that's kind of driving, I think, marriage down and driving marital quality relatively down a little bit and, and, and divorce up a bit too, for, particularly for working class and poor couples. Yeah. So, yeah. So I want to drill down a little bit more into this, this, this class question in relation to male employment, because can we, 
the two scenarios I'm imagining in my head in relation to the the the, the stay at home dad, right? One is where you have a working class couple where the dad is unemployed, maybe unemployable, and mm-hmm. he ends up being right. the one who's at home and primary caregiver because there's you know not much else to do. But it's not by choice by any means, and there's a lot of sure. financial pressure on the wife, and he's right. not necessarily doing as much childcare and housework as she would like, and whatever. So that's one scenario. The other scenario is the much more bougie scenario where you have the um, the female breadwinner who's doing a high earning right. job, and yeah. the man who's like mm. a vocational stay at home dad. Can sure. we tease those apart in the day? That's a great question, now, and, I, and I didn't I didn't do that in, in terms of the looking at. So all I all I can tell you from the book is that women tend to be happier when they're married to guys who are employed full time and when they're married moms. Um, but, you know, in terms of my qualitative research, I, I did interview working class, you know, wives, mothers. Um, and I definitely heard a lot of frustrations articulated around um, earnings and work ethic and housework and childcare. Um, that were just more pronounced among the working class uh, women that I spoke with, you know, women who are working in places like Panera, for instance, in the United States, or, or like a Starbucks in the United States, for instance. And you just see in, in this group of women that the men in their lives are more likely, you know, to be um, spending a lot of time on a screen, not be working for And, you know, his movement in and out of the labor force um, his lack of attachment to a full-time job is, again, not true for <clears throat> obviously many working-class couples. But I just heard those con- you know, complaints about kind of his connection to the workforce were much more likely to be articulated by working-class and, and lower-income women in general with kids. And then I do have, in, obviously, in the book, data showing that um, you know, in that second-income quintile and that bottom-income quintile, women with kids are much more likely to be bearing, you know, the lion's share of the, of the burden of providing financially for their kids. And then often then doing that, you know, what's called that second shift at home with, you know, housework and, and cooking and everything else. And so that's just uh, not a, not a great combination um, in those situations. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see how that would make marriages more vulnerable, particularly when, well, because it's now, very much not seen as a, a, an obligation to stay in a marriage and women are, are single mothers all the time. You can see how this would make these marriages more vulnerable because women feeling very resentful and they, they some women may think, and um, some women might be right to think that actually their lives would be easier if they just were doing this actually on their own and they didn't have a man kind of weighing them down. Right. So, and, and it's important to you to specify here too, that I'm talking here in the working class and, and, and poor couples that I've spoken to, we're talking here about both folks who are married and folks who are just cohabiting. And, but it's, this dynamic is, you know, it's just more common in that demographic and it's a source of enormous frustration for them and, and, um, and, you know, and conflict and, and then often will lead to either a divorce for the married couples or to a breakup for the cohabiting couples. Um, and it's obviously part and parcel too of the way in which I think a lot of our young men today don't have a clear sense of their identity as men, don't connect masculinity to, um, you know, providing for a family in some kind of clear and compelling way. And the result is not progress, it's regress. Um, just going back to the, the fathers involved thing, I, I just remembered some research that I've read um, from the UK, and I don't know if this is also true for the States, but... Um, what I believe is true for the UK is that up until the turn of this century, um, it was the, the correlation between how much time a father spent with his children and his income um, was a slightly negative one. So lower earning men spent slightly more time with their children than did higher earning men. And maybe that was partly to do with being unemployed or, you know, but th- that that correlation was slightly negative. Whereas now it's positive and actually the 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 elites, very high earning men, um, are particularly likely to be the very hands on dads. And as you know, I, I, I anecdotally I do notice this from um, uh, walking around affluent parts of London, and you will see 
you will see men with the babies on their chests and <laughs> you know like it's quite high status actually I think for men to be very very involved do you see that as well in uh the sure American kind context? of in general and it's it's related both to sort of marriage obviously and it's related to to um yeah I think just sort of different different cultural norms but I would say that in general more educated, more affluent men, partly because they're more likely to be married to the mother of their children, are more likely to be engaged with their kids. Um, you know, obviously we've got soccer on Saturdays and violin lessons on Friday nights or Thursday nights, whatever the case might be. And uh, for people who are religious, going to church with your kids on Sunday morning, um, helping kids home with homework on you know Monday and Wednesday nights. So yeah, so I think the more educated, more affluent demographic tends to have pretty invested in involved men. And that's cert certainly, I think, in the main, a good thing. Now, of course, there are exceptions for guys who are extremely, you know, high powered careers that involve a lot of travel or <clears throat> insane hours at work, then they're not going to be, you know, father winning father of the year. But in general, we do see that more educated, more affluent Americans, um, dads are, um, are more likely to be involved with their kids today. Um, so that's, yeah, that's definitely a, a thing. And again, it's so this, I talk about a kind of a family first marriage too in the book. And, and again, the irony is that a kind of implicit tacit familism um, is often being lived out in, in many privileged, you know, neighborhoods and homes across the country, even at the same time that those very, you know, um, parents are not doing often anything in the, in the public square to publicly, you know, articulate or affirm, um, you know, the kinds of things they're doing with their own kids and their own families. Are they, are they affirming these values with their own children? Do they wish for their own children to, to, to have the same kind of 1950s? Well, as here's them? the rub, <laughs> Louise. Here's the rub, I think. So I think, you know, the, the big question I have is, you know, <clears throat> um, are, are kind of our, the sort of 40 something, 50 something folks like myself, who are, you know, well-educated and whatnot, you know, in my demographic, often more kind of sort of formally liberal when it comes to um, family issues. They, they embrace family diversity and all this kind of stuff. Um, but again, they kind of get, stay married, live family-centered lives. Um, but I'm just wondering about the transmission to the next generation, right? Because there's a growing divide between liberals and conservatives when it comes to uh, being married among young adults. So I think everyone in, who kind of is listening to you is going to realize that, yes, conservatives are more likely to be married. But it's not just that they're more likely to be married, it's that the gap, and, and everyone's losing ground here, unfortunately. This, that's the bad news. Like both conservatives and liberals are losing ground when it comes to their odds of being married. But the gap between conservatives and liberals, you know, that I talk about in, in the back of the book um, is growing as well. So I just wonder if kind of more progressive, left leaning, you know, parents of my age. Are going to be surprised when they turn, you know, um, sixty or sixty-five, and they're not seeing their kids getting married. And then when they turn seventy-five, um, you know, not seeing their kids having children. You know, um, so I just think there may be a way in which some of the newer cultural dynamics, which are even more, I think, kind of anti-family, more individualistic, you know, um, are going to end up. Uh, leading to, um, you know, what we call kind of, or what I would call kind of the shaker syndrome. Do you know the shakers, that, that religious group at all, Luis? I do, but I explain for yeah. anyone listening who doesn't. So, yeah. So, I mean, there's some great furniture in the United States. It's um, shaker, and it was made by this religious uh, group back in the, primarily in the 19th century, primarily in upstate New York, um, you know, very um, uh, charismatic kind of religious group a lot of intense communal life, but they basically prohibited kind of um, marriage and uh, childbearing. And so um, they had a, they had their heyday in the 19th century, um, but I think they're just one or two shakers. And obviously they only, they only can kind of like get by, um, by uh, bringing people into the fold, you know? Um, so anyways, the point that I'm making simply is that I think one challenge facing more progressive um, parents today or left-wing parents today is that kids may really embrace a lot of the cultural dynamics now kind of running across our culture that tend to be profoundly, um, I think, um, corrosive when it comes to dating, 
mating, marriage, and childbirth. Mm. So this, so this uh, characterization of the strivers that they they're still living in the nineteen fifties. This might, this may well not last. Right. So the question I think, and we, so I think you know, so yes, yeah, so currently strivers are doing pretty, you know, pretty well on the family front. But the question is, how do their um, how do their teenagers and their twenty something kids do um, in a world that's even that much less friendly to marriage than it was when they were coming up, um, and and less um, friendly to childbearing, as you as you know. And that tends to place more of a premium on career and or just sort of having a good time or staring at a screen. Um, so in this new world that we're living in, where um, I think, um, you know, for more elite minded folks, kind of education and career are, are even more valued than they were, you know, in my day. Um, and we're, you know, we're spending too much time on our <clears throat> on our devices. Um, it becomes that much more difficult. And so for people who are not really being intentional about dating with an eye towards marrying and who don't really value marriage, you know, which is the case for a lot of young adults today, unfortunately, then their prospects for both marriage and parenthood are going to be, I think, much diminished. How much of a relationship is there between young people not valuing marriage and young people who are the products of uh, divorce? To what extent is this a negativity forged from family breakup? That's certainly part of the story. Yeah, we do see that, you know, I think, you know, young adults have experienced divorce, but also in the U.S. now, obviously, cohabitation, what I call like the family go around, borrowing from Andrew Turlin's book, The Marriage Go Around. But, um, you know, for kids today, the bigger issue is not divorce. It's just cohabitation, single parenthood and, and the instability that follows from that. So, yeah, I think for kids who've experienced chaotic home situation or experienced, you know, divorce or some other kind of family dysfunction, they're much more likely to look at marriage with a kind of jaundiced eye. And, uh, you know, not surprisingly, it's, it's understandable. But the problem though, is that <clears throat> marriage is the, the strongest, you know, uh, well, basically marital quality is the strongest predictor of happiness in America. And so I think what people don't realize today in America is it's not your job that's gonna kind of deliver you into like a meaningful and happy life as much as it is a good family life. Mm. Um, again, probing a little bit on, on, on correlation and causation, is it possible that people who are more prone to getting divorced are more, say, neurotic, that there are some personality factors which would lead to them also being less happy regardless of their marital setup? Is that something that we can tease out at all? Great question. And there are obviously some on the right today, Louise, who want to sort of argue that basically, you know, everything about family life is just an expression of genetics, right? So like, you know, I'll talk about like the connection between family instability and kids, you know, having more difficulty in their lives. And I'll get critics from the right saying, the left will say it's poverty, right? Oh, Brad, you're look overlooking poverty. But now from the right, I'll get some folks saying, Brad, look, this is all genetics, you know, and the kinds of kids whose moms were, you know, depressed, are going to be the kinds of kids who are depressed as teenagers, right? That's, that's, it's all genes, Brad. I mean, it's, it's, there's, you know, it's all biology. And obviously, you know, the truth is somewhere in between. It's both kind of, it's, it's poverty, it's genes, it's culture, it's institutions. And so to be, to be more concrete here, though, we have actually good twin studies now where we're looking at um, identical and fraternal twin women, right? Who get married, have kids, and then one twin gets divorced one twin does not get divorced. And using this twin model, you can figure out, you know, to an important extent, sort of how much it looks like some of these family instability effects are about genetics versus what they would, what these psychologists call environment, that is, you know, the divorce. Um, and it turns out that, yeah, you know, the different shares for different outcomes, but on a lot of these social and emotional outcomes, even the twin studies are telling us that, yes, there's a unique effect uh, that divorce um, has on our children. And what's also interesting about this newer work on biology and environment and family and children is that we're also seeing there's kind of an interaction effect often playing out for our children as well. So what we see is that um, certain boys have kind of like a genetic risk for, you know, maybe engaging in risky, like excessively risky behavior. Um, and they tend to be especially affected by family instability or by the absence of their own father. Um, so it's not that it's genes or environment, it's that it's actually both. And we're seeing for some kids, you know, they're just kind of resilient in the face of family instability. They, you know, they do fine, 
And that's true for many kids. And we know that obviously there are many successful people like Barack Obama, you know, who come from a, you know, single parent home. I was raised by a single mom, you know, did fine in most respects. But there are kids um, who have kind of genetic risk. Is there any um, useful data from adoption studies as well? You mentioned twin studies already, but I guess so many adopted kids are going to be coming from very broken homes and often will be adopted into very, I mean, cause, because adopted parents are selected often for being, for being married, for being super stable. You know, do we, is there useful data from there as well to, to see the, um, the positive effects that marriage can have on kids? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think um, on, on adoption specifically, I've written with uh, Nicholas Zill about kind of, you know, basically like this adoption paradox. And that is that adoptive parents tend to be more educated, more affluent. Um, and yet on a lot of social and emotional outcomes, adoptive kids are more likely to be struggling. Um, so we do see that when it comes to like incarceration, for instance, that um, adopted I mean, young men who are adopted, young men especially who were adopted are much more likely to spend time in jail or in prison in the United States. And that's in, in the book. Um, I was talking to a friend and colleague in, in Minnesota uh, who had adopted a young woman. And he said the first time the police came to his door, he was just kind of like floored and shocked. Um, but by the third time they came, he was a bit more kind of able to handle, you know, the situation. So again, it's not true for most adoptive kids, thankfully, but it's certainly just more common among adoptive kids that there's some kind of difficulty with the law, for instance. Um, at the same time, I find that, you know, um, adoptive kids are more likely to graduate from college than um, kind of any other non-intact group of young adults. So of course the, the kids who are most likely to steer clear of prison and jail and are most likely to graduate from college are uh, young men and young women from intact biological married families. Um, but adoptive kids, again, and all these social emotional outcomes tend to do worse. And I think it's, you know, partly because um, there's a way in which as they become adolescents and young adults often, but not always, they kind of, they kind of wonder well, why did my, my biological parents put me up for adoption. Why did my biological mom, you know, what was going on? That, that can be hard. Um, you know, their parents don't look like them oftentimes, don't think like them, don't act like them. And there's a certain gap in terms of just that um, kind of filial connection for adoptive kids sometimes that can be challenging. And, you know, for kids who are being adopted across racial and ethnic lines too, you know, there's, there can be some cultural gaps as well. So, um, Adoption is just more challenging for kids, and that's reflected in the data. One more piece, though, on the on the data, though, is I looked kind of at family instability in kids. The, the thing that was kind of most, I think, shocking to me was that I found that for young men, they're more likely to end up in prison or jail today in the United States than they are to graduate from college if they are being raised in any kind of non-intact family combination. Lennon families, I mean, stepfamily, single mother family, single father family, adopted family. Uh, by contrast, you know, young men are being raised by the intact married biological parents are just way more likely to graduate from college than they are to land in prison or in jail. So it's kind of like the most, you know, it's like we've heard about kind of like the school to prison pipeline, you know, in the elite discourse. But there's like a, <laughs> there's a family to prison pipeline that we never hear about. And this family to prison pipeline basically starts in, you know, unstable and more dysfunctional homes and it puts kids on a path young men on a path, boys on a path that leads, you know, too often to, uh, to prison or, or, or to jail. Mm -mm. We should talk about uh, step parents as a factor here, right? Because, um, I think most listeners will probably be familiar with the Cinderella effect. So called the fact that children who are, um, it's particularly with unrelated males. It's particularly with a stepfather, mum's boyfriend in the home are much, 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 much more vulnerable to uh, violent and sexual abuse um, than our children raised with their own fathers at home. Um, it's not just though physical abuse. It's also all sorts of kind of unhappy emotional outcomes from having step parents in the house. I don't want to malign all, there are clearly wonderful step parents out there. You know, we're talking about averages here, but this does seem, this does seem to be an important factor, right? In, in, in talking about blended families as if it was an entirely neutral <laughs> phenomenon. The episode is not over. 
there is another maybe 30 minutes of content, but it is behind a paywall. If you would like access to that content, if you would like to show support for the show, pay subscriptions are what keep it on the road. Allow me to pay my producers, put food on the table, all that important stuff. The extended version of the podcast is available at my Substack, louiseperry.substack.com. That's where you can also find, as I say every week, bonus episodes, extended episodes, uh, the MMM chat community, all of this. Um, please sign up for a pay subscription. It makes such an enormous difference to my ability to keep producing the podcast and grow it even bigger, produce more episodes, all that good stuff. There are other ways that you can show your support for the show as well. You can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. You can like us on YouTube. You can tell your friends and family uh, how much you like the show. If you find it valuable, all of these things make an enormous difference to our ability to keep making it. Thank you so much. <laughs>